Hi there, how you doing? Um, there's a video I've been wanting to make for quite a while, um, which I finally decided to bite the bullet and go ahead and do. Uh, effectively, what I'd like to do is look at and analyse the fight scene in the first Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes film. Uh, you'll know the scene if you've seen the film. Um, it opens up, we've got Sherlock Holmes in, in a wooden enclosure, which is clearly supposed to be some kind of um, fighting ring that's in maybe an underground in a tavern, there's people betting, and he's fighting against a really big guy. Uh, he gets distracted by uh, a handkerchief and he realizes that he needs to go and he tries to leave. The other fighter spits on the back of his head, he runs through the fight in his head, works out exactly what he's going to do, and then does it. And it all happens. In the, the, on the film in quite a long played out sequence but in the reality of the film it all happens within a few seconds. Um, but what I thought it'd be interesting to do is to actually look at the, the choreography of the fight scene and see how it reflects the way people were actually fighting. Is this actually classical pugilism in any way? Um, I don't know Guy Ritchie, I don't know the choreographers, I don't know what they've used. I've been told there's a degree of Wing Chun in there. Um, maybe, maybe not, who knows. Um, it, some of the techniques of classical pugilism are, are often mistaken for, for Wing Chun. There's some similarities, the, the vertical fist, that kind of thing. Um, but we'll have a look. Um, the first thing we need to know though is the, the context that this is set in. Um, is that accurate? The film's set in 1890 in London, um, so there's a degree of, of flexibility there because, let's be honest, if it were to be a, a bare-knuckle bout, it wouldn't be a, a sanctioned one, if you like. Not that fights were properly sanctioned back then, but the London prize ring had stopped at that point, and the Marquess of Queensbury's rules were the only rule set in official usage. I think the last title defence for the London Prize Ring was in 1889. So, you know, we can give them a year. We can maybe say, okay, there probably will, were still bare knuckle boxing fights going on using the London Prize Ring rule set. Um, so we'll we'll assume that that's the context. So without me going on too much more, let's have a look through the film the film, through the fight scene of the film, and then we'll go back and break it down in, into its individual bits and have a look at the techniques and, and take it from there. Sorry, couldn't do it. Um, there's that first exchange, we, we need to talk about it. Um, I can't let you see the rest of the film until we, we've got this, this sorted. It's both brilliant and also horrible. Uh, and I'll try and explain why. It opens, it sets the scene really nicely. We get a lovely kind of um, image of the kind of place it is. It's a bit dark, it's a bit dingy, there's lots of people there, it's kind of noisy, there's lots of talking, there's gambling going on, uh, it's a bit grimy and a bit seedy and the music's great, it evokes the kind of Irish connection to bare knuckle boxing which is, is very, very accurate and, and the fight starts and we've got a little dark haired wiry guy against a huge muscly bald headed bloke uh, who goes rushing in and throws some great big round heavy blows and that's great. Uh, if we read the, the, the boxing writers of the period, people like Alanson Wynn uh, and even earlier writers, people from the time of Broughton, then we'll see that these round blows are very much considered the mark of an unskilled man, the big powerful brute throwing huge, heavy, slow blows that are easy to avoid. And that's exactly what we see. Um, we've got Sherlock Holmes slipping and ducking and moving underneath these, and the guy throws three, and all three of them miss, and that's great. And on the third one, when Sherlock Holmes ducks underneath it, he throws a little contracted arm strike into the body of his opponent, and up to that point, it's brilliant. We then 
he changes a little bit. Um, he, he throws what looks like a, a very quick hammer fist into the kidneys, which in all honesty, in that sort of position, throwing that sort of way, it, he's, he's not even going to feel. And from there, he throws what looks like a kind of big round blow onto the, the back of the opponent's head. And we can't really see it. Um, so let's have a look at it in slow motion and see if that makes it any clearer. Because this could be a really, really impressive piece of choreography, or it could be a bit crap. Let's go find out. I don't think it's a back fist, um, which is disappointing. Um, Mendoza was famous for the use of a technique called the chopper, which is made with, with a, a fist. It rolls around and strikes with the, the knuckles in a downward direction with the back of the hand. It's aimed for the face, the jaw, the head in general. And this was something he was renowned for, a huge proponent of it. Other fighters didn't like it, but Mendoza used it with great effect and it became part of the accepted uh, pugilistic toolbox if you like purely because Mendoza did it. That's not what we're seeing here. It's difficult to see because of the way it's been edited it's got that kind of confusing feel to it where everything's a bit blurry and you can't see for certain. But what we can see when we look at the slow motion is that there's a hammer fist that comes in and this kind of comes down in a kind of it would be fine if he were wearing gloves, if he had hand wraps, if his hands were protected in some way, but to put that in with any force, he's going to smash his fingers to pieces before he does any damage to the back of somebody's head. Which makes it even worse that his opponent, who gets hit on the back of the head with this, goes flying across the ring as if he's been clubbed with a baseball bat. But, that aside, you know, the ratio is still pretty good. The average is, is good. We're, we've got several good techniques, good moves, things that work well with the historical context, and, and, and one, maybe two moves that are a bit dodgy. So let's watch the next bit of the fight, and hopefully we'll see more of the good stuff and less of the, the, the poor stuff. I'm not entirely sure what I've just seen. Um, it looked to all the world as if the two of them were playing some kind of children's clapping game. Um, when you watch through that section, and I'll, I'll put it up again in slow motion so you can watch it again, I'm fairly certain I'm right, but it seems to me that Sherlock Holmes slaps his opponent's arm five times and slaps the side of his face twice. At no point does he appear to punch him. No point does he counter punch, he doesn't block, he doesn't hit his opponent's arms hard enough to actually move him around, he just simply slaps at his arms and slaps at his face, and it's all open hand stuff. And I don't really know where that's coming from, because that's certainly not classical pugilism. And let's be honest, you know, even if you take out all of the historical flavour, that's not bare knuckle boxing. It's not boxing. It's... I don't know. It's something that isn't boxing? Let's have a look. In slow motion, it's even clearer. This is all open hand stuff. Lots of slapping, uh, back of the hand across the face. For the purposes of, of not going crazy, 
I'm simply going to assume that this is deliberately written into the plot as a way of Sherlock Holmes antagonising his opponent in the ring without actually doing any harm, and he's doing this on purpose. Um, so, that in mind, let's just put that aside and move on to the next bit. I just want to talk really briefly about this, that last little clip there. Um, I love it. To me, that makes the whole fight, you know, I can cope with dodgy technique, I can cope with modern technique masquerading as historical technique, because the flavour of the fight is, is authentic. And it's given a lot of that by the stances that the fighters use when they're not actually throwing blows. Look at it again. Look at the stance that Holmes is in. He's got his, his elbows tucked in, he's got his arms out, he's got his lead arm out, he's got his palms facing up. It's an absolutely classic transitional pugilistic stance. Now, it's not quite Mendoza's stance, and that's clearly who, who a lot of the influence is, is coming from, but it, it's great, you know, it's perfect. The other guy is clearly, again, being depicted as somebody with less science, um, more strength and power, but not the same sort of ability of boxing. Um, so just that short little clip, I'll play it again right now, uh, but we'll run on and we'll look at the next bit and we'll talk about that in a second. We're just going to gloss over this bit. Um, it's more of the tip tappy stuff. Uh, there's a lovely counter punch, a little dig into the short ribs from the opponent. Um, Drop back into guard, that's nice, the opponent charges, and he just kind of sweeps him out of the way. <sighs> that's not something that I've seen in any historical manuals, so I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, pretend it didn't happen, let's move on to the next bit. I was quite tempted to skip through this next bit, but um, there's something in there that's quite important. There's a lot more slappy stuff, so we've got Sherlock Holmes doing open hands, trying to antagonise his opponent, um, the other guy's charging around. Not a, excuse me, not a great deal of, of, um, of relevant things in there, but there is one thing that shows quite clearly that this fight is not taking place according to the London prize ring rules. Um, and that's when his opponent picks him up, a double leg takedown, lifts him up in the air, charges him against the barrier, throws him on the floor. Um, it says quite clearly in the London prize ring that seizing an antagonist below the waist shall be deemed foul. Um, so we can say for certain, this is not a London prize ring uh, rules fight. That being said, we were fairly clear that that was the case. It's taking place on a hard floor, it's got a wooden circle instead of four posts and a square ring. The London prize ring was quite specific about how the ring needs to be laid out, so obviously this is not that. So we're going to skip through a bit now because there's a little bit where um, Sherlock Holmes is distracted by the, the handkerchief and we're going to move on to the bit of the fight where it starts to get entertaining. First, distract target. Then block his blind jab. Counter with cross to left cheek. This is where it starts to get interesting. Throws the handkerchief. Distracts him. Fine, we can ignore that. That's, that's just... Uh, narrative. Block, blind, jab. Yeah, okay, that works. The guy's fighting from a left lead, very traditional, and the most common move from that was a left lead. Um, a left jolt, a leading off, uh, a falling step, whatever you want to call it, that lead hand straight punch was absolutely classically classical pugilism in, in flavour. Uh, it was used in a very different way to modern boxing, but it's there. So. The fact that Sherlock Holmes assumes that's what he's going to do, absolutely fine. It was commonly used to stop people advancing on you, 
So you could use it in a defensive way, you can use it to clear some space, you could use it to set up other moves, you could use it as a knockout punch in and of its own right. So the assumption that his opponent's going to throw one is absolutely fine from the point of view of classical pugilism as a whole art. I'm a little puzzled as to why he thinks his opponent's going to throw one, bearing in mind he's not thrown a single straight blow since we've been watching the fight. But, you know, we can set that aside. Now we're looking at some techniques that actually work. So we've blocked the blind jab, counter with a cross. Now this is really interesting because I think, and I could be wrong, but I suspect that this, they've inadvertently become historically very accurate here. Um, in modern parlance, a cross is simply a straight punch thrown from the rear hand. Simple as that. That's known as a cross. Um, it tends to be a right cross. Um, and in that, from that perspective, this works really well. But the earlier we go back, the more we see something called the cross counter, which is a very specific type of punch, which is thrown over the jab. So the jab comes out in a straight line. The cross comes over it into the side of the face. Um, and what we see here is a really nice looking cross counter, a beautiful pugilistic technique. So, we've got that, let's see what happens next. Discombobulate. Dazed will attempt wild haymaker, employ elbow block and body shot. We're going to ignore the discombobulate thing. Um, mainly because it's not something I've come across in any of the period uh, treatises. Now, it's possible that as a technique it's in some of the self-defense stuff, some of the Bartitsu-esque uh, sources, um, but that's not my area of expertise so I'm not going to comment. It's certainly not acceptable within uh, the London Prize Ring or the Broughton Jewels era or the Marcus of Queensbury's rules, so we're just going to say it's a cool word, it's a fancy technique, it looks good, and I can fully see why they've included that in the fight itself because it makes the fight look really pretty flashy. Um, but from that point we go uh, dazed he'll attempt wild haymaker. Yep, that's a pretty good guess based on the way we've seen this guy fight. Uh, he's very, very likely to throw a big sweeping wild haymaker. He's thrown a lot of them and um, they've never worked but he's going to keep doing it. Uh, elbow block. Again, this is a perfect technique. This is something that's talked about a lot. Uh, Mendoza talks about a way to block round blows is to bring your elbow up towards the side of your head. Now, when um, Robert Downey Jr. does it, he brings his hand up and, and kind of extends it, and it makes a really stylized block. And that's not how it was done. It was simply brought up in, uh, to the side of the head, absorbs all the pressure, takes the sting out of the blow, and allows you to keep fighting. But, you know, we'll forgive them that. We'll forgive them taking a block and making it look a little bit flashier and uh, throw in a body shot. Absolutely perfect. Block the round blow, use the rotational force to drive a low contracted arm strike into the mark. Perfect. Loving it so far. Let's see what happens next. Block ferrule left. Weaken right jaw. Now fracture. Block the low left. Elbow to the jaw. Um, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable. We see a low block, comes down like a hammer fist into the arm um, in Mendoza. Uh, it's, it's a nice little block and it, it stuns the arm as well. It doesn't just stop the punch coming, it deliberately attacks into the arm. That's great. The elbow strikes the jaw. I don't really like the way he, he delivers it. Um, again, they seem to have sacrificed good technique for looking good on, on film. You know, that's fair enough, can't blame them for that. Um, elbow strikes were perfectly acceptable, they were acceptable in the early era, they were acceptable in the Broughton Rules era, and they were acceptable in the London Prize Ring era. Uh, it was only when the Marcus of Queensbury came in that suddenly they were no longer allowed. Um, so we don't have an issue with those. Um, and then we have, you know, break already weakened jaw. Um, I take exception to that from an anatomical point of view. My my instinct is that if you can elbow somebody at full force in the side of the jaw and that doesn't break it, then punching them is certainly not going to break the jaw. Um, and with bones, you can only really weaken them by breaking them. It's a bit like trying to break a piece of chalk, you know? You can't weaken a piece of chalk by bending it a little bit and then try and snap it. It's either snapped or it isn't. 
and that's pretty much how bones work. So, you know, I like the combination, I like the low block, I like the elbow strike, I like the punch to the jaw, that's great, that works, it's authentic, I like it, I like the fact that it's thrown with a, a vertical-ish fist, um, but we're going to have to ignore the, the anatomy and physiology for now because that doesn't really, doesn't really work for me. But the fighting's good, so what's next? Break cracked ribs. Traumatize solar plexus. Dislocate jaw entirely. Break cracked ribs. Traumatize solar plexus. Dislocate jaw entirely. Um, yeah, I don't have any issues with any of those. Uh, break cracked, rib, cracked ribs. Well, I don't remember being told that they were cracked, but you know what? Fair enough, I can live with that. Um, a nice low punch to the to the floating ribs, brilliant, that's pretty good. Traumatised solar plexus, it's a little bit of a flashy way to describe it, uh, but a peg to the mark, as it was known, a short contracted arm strike to the solar plexus, was a really very common fight stopping technique at the time. Uh, Broughton was, was well known to use that back in the very early days of pugilism. So that's great. Uh, dislocate jaw entirely. Yeah, okay, I think it's, again, we're, we're, we're entering into that realm where techniques are being thrown in because they look and sound good, not because they're, they're authentic, but that's okay. The techniques we're being shown are all authentic. The punches are coming in, the, the, the low punches are coming in, they're being driven by the hips, they're contract, contacting with the knuckles into, into the body, that's great. The punch to the face is coming in, it's a straight punch, vertical fist, contacting with the centre knuckles, that's all great. This is classical pugilism. This is good stuff. Let's see how he finishes it. Heel kick to diaphragm. In Heel kick to diaphragm. Ah well, knew it was too good to last. Um, not really the sort of technique that you'd see in any of the English systems. So, from the early era, technically kicking was allowed. Through the Broughton's Rules era, technically kicking was allowed. But Whilst purring, kicking within English martial arts was, was something that, that existed, it was a, a form of fighting, and you see a degree of that in some of the, the shin kicking um, and Devon Norfolk wrestling systems that, that still exist. Within the pugilistic ring, which we assume that this is to some degree trying to represent, kicking was definitely not, um, not considered the done thing. When French fighters came over and fought English fighters, the fact that the French fighters kicked was something that, that at least within England, was kind of frowned upon. Um, also, within the London prize ring rules, and I know I keep talking about this a lot, but kicking was very much against the rules, so yet another sign that this is a fight that's taking place outside of any agreed rule set of the time. That being said, you know, in the main, I think they've done a really good job with this fight to try and put together something that has the right feel to it. And it's very easy for me to sit and com um, complain about the fact that some of the techniques they're showing aren't really classical pugilism techniques. The fact that um, Sherlock Holmes is not moving in a way that, that fits with classical pugilism. But the fact is, why would he within a film? Because Robert Downey Jr as far as I know, doesn't study Regency bare knuckle boxing or, or later bare knuckle boxing. It's not something that many people do. Um, however, it, it is a very interesting system. Obviously, Robert Downey Jr. does something. There's, there's, a, there's a feel to his moves. He knows how to move either that or he's, he's very good at picking up stuff that the, the fight choreographer passes on. I suspect he's a martial artist from watching him. I don't know. Why don't, if you know, let me know. Comment down below and, and tell me. Um, I do enjoy it. It's a good film to watch. I can suspend disbelief enough that I can put that to one side. The music's very good. The way it's filmed is very good. The lighting's good. The whole thing is good. The script's good. The way that they've kind of tried to work in the fact that Sherlock Holmes is a very intelligent man and he uses that to uh, inform his fight, that's great too. And it's a very enjoyable fight. There's a lot of classical pugilism in there, but it's not all classical pugilism. So, um, so there you go. I hope you've enjoyed this. I've certainly enjoyed making this video. If you'd like to know more about classical pugilism as an art, and you can learn it, uh, go on to pugilism.org and sign up for membership there, and you can learn some of the, the techniques that I've discussed, some of the things that I've talked about. They're all available there, and it's a fantastic art in and of itself. 
Um, let me know what you think. Do you agree with the conclusions I've come to? Um, and if there are any other fights that you'd like me to take a look at, let me know. Take care, guys. Good to see you. Thank <laughs> you.